Okay, so uh, this is a modification of a presentation I gave to the women's board at Montgomery General Hospital a couple years ago on mammography, breast cancer screening, and you that was really designed to inform the ladies that attended the, uh, the lecture, but I did modify it so that it's, it's uh, hopefully educational for everyone who provides some kind of care for women, including breast care. So just a little basics about mammography. Uh, I don't want to talk down to people, but I don't want to speak over people's head. Uh, I've, sp I've given testimony in court martials and trials many times, and the lawyers all say, boy, you have a nice way of just speaking like a common person, because for many years of my life, I was a common person, and I still include myself in that population. But mammography, as you may or may not know, uses x-rays, similar to the radiation in a chest x-ray, to create images that are viewed on either film or on a computer screen. There are standard views that all women uh, are included in, including MLO and CC. And I'll give you a little bit of radiology knowledge. When you see description of x-rays, the, the term describes the path of the x-ray. So an MLO view means the x-ray beam travels from the medial portion of the breast to the lateral portion of the breast in an oblique direction. And a CC, the x-ray beam travels from the cranium, or the cranial part of the breast, to the caudal, or tail part of the breast, uh, in that direction. So when we get to other views, you'll understand why we call things the way we do, including other special views. Women don't like this, but it's true. Compression is very important. You know, all women have said, if, if this was invented by a woman, then it wouldn't be so uncomfortable. But the physics make it so that the compression is very important because you want to be able to have the x-ray beam uh, travel through the same thickness of tissue so that you don't get artifacts related to where the breast is thicker versus thinner. So you want to minimize artifacts on the mammogram so that the interpretation is as accurate as possible. As we've mentioned to someone earlier today, as you may or may not know, comparison to priors is very important. We know when someone has their first mammogram or a mammogram is performed without comparisons, the rate of callback is always greater because we don't really know if, if that's just the way the breast was made, the way it's developed, or if there's something new in there. So we tend to be a little more cautious, a little more worried when we see something on a mammogram that doesn't have comparisons to make sure that we're not missing something that's new that we just haven't imaged before. Uh, American Cancer Society and a lot of the radiologic societies recommend annual screening starting at the age of 40 uh, and then continuing. Oftentimes people ask questions about, well, I have a first degree biological relative that was diagnosed at X age. That's a special population and we'll get into that. But the earliest anyone would recommend a mammogram would be 10 years prior to the age of onset of breast cancer in a first degree biological relative. So for example, if someone's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at say 42, then a lot of experts would say, well that person should start screening at 32. Now that is sometimes still debated, and I trust the clinicians that provide breast care and those that run high risk clinics to help make those decisions with women, but that's the earliest anyone should ever recommend initiation of mammography. And as you may or may not know, mammography is highly regulated by the government. They make sure the, uh, the machines work properly. They are, they are checked at least annually. Uh, the quality of the images is checked on a daily basis before any mammograms can even be performed. And this is the Mammography Quality Standards Act. So the credentials of who does the mammograms, the credentials of the technologists, the equipment, the screens that it's read on, if it was filmed to make sure that the chemical uh, reagents were all in the right balance before mammography can be performed. So types of mammography. Historically, film screen or mammograms produced on film were the, much, were the most common. Uh, film screen mammography is still done, but digital mammography done without film but using a detector and then looked at on a computer screen is becoming more and more common. The transition for our group occurred several years ago and initially it's a challenge when you're comparing a film mammogram to a digital mammogram 
because digital mammography, uh, most would agree, gives you better resolution for a variety of abnormalities. And sometimes it's hard to know, is this a new abnormality or is it we just didn't see it before because the prior mammogram was film? Uh, but that's becoming less and less common as priors are now digitized or visible on the, uh, the computer network. Tomosynthesis is a relatively new addition to breast imaging. Uh, I have a screen, a slide later on, that goes over the physics of how that works. And the other thing, the other big advance in the last decade or so, I'm not great with dates, but about 10 years, maybe a little longer, are computer-aided detection, where a, uh, a computer algorithm is applied to the image and it helps radiologists identify areas that might be suspicious. Uh, these computer uh, algorithms look for areas of greater density in one spot versus others, looks for areas of small calcifications, and looks for areas where the contour of the breast tissue changes acutely. Most breast tissue has kind of round lobulations. If you think about little glandular areas, a lot of areas are rounded. So when a rounded edge interfaces with something uh, that's growing the other direction, it causes a change in the contour, and a lot of these algorithms are designed to evaluate those. And essentially, it's saying to the radiologist, look here again. You know, look at the mammogram, but then you put on the CAD or the computer-aided detection, and it tells you, look in these areas again, just to make sure you're seeing what the, the computer is seeing. And that's, what it, that's how we use it. We don't use it. The computer-aided detection does not read the mammogram, does not tell you where to biopsy. It says, look here again, and then drive on. So types of mammography. Two major types, screening mammograms and diagnostic mammograms. For the great majority of patients, screening mammography is going to be uh, what someone has on an annual basis. It's routine for asymptomatic breasts. It's best if it's performed around the same time of year and around the same time of the month uh, on women that are premenopausal. Uh, Postmenopausal, the time of the month is no longer pertinent, but we do know, those of us that are breast imagers know, and women know, that the breast undergoes cyclic changes prior to menopause. And so you want to try to have the mammogram between 40 and when you hit menopause somewhere around the same time of the month, both for comfort, because if the breast is not as painful, you'll get better compression and a better mammogram, and reproduction, because uh, the breast uh, during the, the phase right before the period comes can have a different density and more fullness than a mammogram done uh, the week after uh, the, the period arrives. And so we want to try to do that. Screening mammograms are often read the next day. If they're done on a Friday, maybe they'll get read on Monday. If they're done at night, not till the next day. But there's usually no hurry in reading a screening mammogram because it's a regular asymptomatic uh, patient. And again, for most women. Diagnostic mammography, as you see here, a lot of different reasons. You know, whether it be a previous abnormal screening mammogram, having a biopsy for something that even though it turned out benign, might uh, indicate a higher risk for that patient. And it's usually read when the patient is there. Now, as we know, and in my experience, sometimes a woman will come back for the diagnostic mammogram and there'll be an abnormality and we'll say, this really should be evaluated with ultrasound. And they'll say, oh, it's 2.30, I have to be at the bus stop by three, I can't do it right now. And we'll, they'll schedule an ultrasound or schedule something else at a later time. But for the most part, read while you're there. But I cannot say that with absolute, because women lead lives that are often very busy and life sometimes gets in the way. And a relatively small percentage of women get diagnostic uh, mammograms. Some get them on a regular basis because of their risk factors. First degree biological relative, some abnormality that is a high risk, a high risk for uh, subsequent breast cancer. Next please. So this is just, these are not to scale. These are not to real life, but they are to scale. So this is, this was, I saw this I think at a uh, annual meeting of the Radiologic Society of North America. It came on a little card. You know, like on uh, sometimes breast, breast uh, what is it called? Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We were handing out these little cards at Walter Reed uh, to give to women. And it shows if you have your first mammogram, uh, 
the relative size of an abnormality that turns out to be cancer compared to that detected after having regular mammography uh, in terms of differences in how we can detect an abnormality. Women doing regular uh, self breast self-exam, women doing occasional breast self-exam, and women that aren't doing any kind of breast exam that just get a breast exam once a year when they see their doctor or if they don't even see their doctor once a year. We as radiologists hate to see mammograms with large masses and the history says patient felt a mass because when the history says patient felt a mass it means that this was not picked up when something was small and probably easily more easily detected by mammography. It varies but this is just to give you some sense of the the differences in how things can be detected. Next please. Okay, this was again the slide from a talk member given to women. If your screening mammogram is abnormal and you get one of those phone calls saying, we need you to come back for additional views, don't panic. My wife is a panicker. When her first mammogram, she had calcifications that needed additional views, she was a basket case. And I said, honey, don't worry. 80% of abnormal screening mammograms turn out to be nothing, but you don't know, especially if you haven't had mammograms before, and you don't know if something is new or suspicious and it needs further evaluation. You may get additional mammographic images, ultrasound, or both. For the most part, almost always if there's an abnormal screening mammogram, additional mammographic images are obtained because with additional images, we can often see the borders of abnormalities better. We can tell if something is due to overlapping shadows. Remember, you're taking a three-dimensional structure like a breast, putting x-rays through it, putting a detector or a piece of film on the bottom, and you're casting shadows on that detector or piece of film and then looking at it. So if things line up differently than they did the year or two or three before, it might look like there's something new only because of a little difference in the breast position or the breast density because of the cycle. So frequently, those abnormalities disappear. Occasionally, the abnormalities persist. And they say to the radiologist, I'm new and I'm real. In which case, the radiologist's job then is to find where in the breast that real abnormality is, what it actually looks like in terms of its shape, size, density and characteristics and then decide is this something that needs to be biopsied? Is this something that we know as absolutely benign? Or is this something that we should just follow up and see if it changes over time? Sometimes, and I use that really mean that, sometimes other imaging is needed or recommended like breast MRI. I'd say that's rare that you have an abnormal screening mammogram, you have a callback mammogram and breast ultrasound and then still someone is recommending an MRI. That's, uh, it's very rare and often, I'll speak candidly, often it's based on the anxiety of the radiologist not wanting to miss something that could turn out to be a breast cancer. So sometimes uh, a more experienced mammographer will see something, say, oh, I know exactly what that is. We should do a six-month follow-up. A less experienced mammographer will say, I see something I'm not really sure what it is. I don't really want to recommend a biopsy right now, so I'll get myself off hook and I'll recommend an MRI and let Parambo figure it out when he reads the MRI. That happens sometimes, but I, again, it's not as common. Uh, and then even sometimes when the screening mammogram is abnormal, biopsy is needed. And as you may or may not know, even still, with knowing what cancers look like, sometimes we biopsy benign abnormalities because on mammography and on ultrasound, sometimes very benign things look very suspicious. And the pathologist is the final arbiter for what is that that's in the breast? Is it cells reproducing at a high rate like a cancer? Is it some form of scar from a previous trauma? Maybe a biopsy that the patient didn't know about and they didn't tell and they didn't report it on their health screening? Is it an abnormality that is uh, related to uh, the phase of the month? Is an abnormality related to lactation, if it happens to be a woman that had a baby within the last year? Is it something else? But the pathologist is the ultimate arbiter uh, because they look at the cells and they say, do the cells look normal? Do the cells have, change, have signs that they're rapidly reproducing? 
or are there all benign features of this abnormality and it turns out to be some kind of a scar or characteristically benign lesion? Sometimes the mammography and ultrasound and even MRI cannot tell. I can say with confidence that in the last 20 years, 10 years, I've gotten much better at characterizing something in the breast called fat necrosis. So fat necrosis is where some kind of trauma happens, whether it be a biopsy, an elbow in bed, a baby, you know, a car accident and you have your uh, seatbelt on which saves your life and saves your head but causes a, an abnormality in the breast that you really don't notice. But on your next mammogram, something is seen. Uh, and when fat necrosis happens, the cells that are contained, that contain fat in the breast, rupture. And that leads to some scarring and some calcifications. And initially, when breast MRI was introduced, a lot of biopsies were being done on these abnormalities that turned out to be fat necrosis, which pathologists can tell right away. They look and they see, oh, there's scar tissue and there's fat. There aren't cells reproducing. But on MRI, the area around that fat necrosis showed abnormalities that made us all worried. But initially, as time went on, uh, those doing research at places like Hospital Center, you know, MD Anderson, uh, all those big cancer institutes were doing research on all these abnormal breast MRIs and saying, oh wow, this is what fat necrosis looks like on MRI. And then all of us that were reading them said, oh, that's why we keep getting that as a result. And now I'm, I'm, people call me all the time and say, will you take a look at this? And I'll look at it and I'll say, oh, fat necrosis, don't worry about it, it's benign, you don't have to do anything. Because we've gotten as a profession much better at detecting these abnormalities that we see on MRI that we initially didn't know what they were. Please. So diagnostic mammography, again, symptoms, pain, palpable abnormality, nipple discharge, which is an indicator sometimes of ductal carcinoma near the nipple areola, or a papilloma, and sometimes papillomas behind the nipple are papillary cancer, and so those do usually need to be biopsied. You know, a history of breast cancer, at Walter Reed, anybody that was within five years of their uh, diagnosis of breast cancer got a mammogram uh, frequently twice a year and for the first five years. After that, they just had annual diagnostic mammography. And if after 10 years, when they're considered cure out of the woods, then they might go back to screening. But their doctor's decision still ordered whatever they thought was needed. Sometimes, like I said, breast biopsies, say you had a history of a breast biopsy and there turned out to be fat necrosis. Somebody was still might be a little worried. Does Parambo really know what he's talking about, saying this is fat necrosis, and he says recommend follow-up in a year? They still might recommend a diagnostic mammogram in a year. And we look at it and we say, oh yeah, there it is, stable. See you in a year. Continue. So, diagnostic mammograms to see something we see on screening. Magnification and compression are techniques that help us look at the margins or borders of abnormalities. Spot compression, so we talked earlier about uh, overlapping shadows. So the breast has lobules of breast tissue, it has ductal elements, it has ligaments. Raise your hand if you knew your breast had ligaments. Okay, some, some hands know up. Yeah, they're called, they're called Cooper's ligaments. They go between the breast tissue and the skin. And that's why sometimes breast cancer cause changes in the skin or a little retraction of the breast skin or the nipple, a little discoloration sometimes. So sometimes those things that are soft tissue overlap in such a way that it shows an additional density. But if you squish the breast more focally, it's hard to get the same lining up of abnormalities when you compress the breast. And so an abnormality that was seen on a screening, when you compress it, those things kind of move out of the way and you see that there was nothing really there to begin with. Whereas if there's something in the midst of all those overlapping elements, and you compress, that something does not dissipate, and that something is what needs further evaluation. Okay, and then other views. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a breast from one direction, and you see something because they line up in one way, you could do compression, or you could just look at that breast from a different angle. Say the standard is medial to lateral oblique. Well, we could say, well, let's do a regular lateral view, which is, medial to lateral without any oblique. And if the abnormality is still there, you say, oh, 
that's suspicious because the breast should not line up the same way when I'm looking at it in a different direction. Magnification views are often used to look at calcifications. And women will ask me all the time, they'll say, are the calcifications abnormal? And I'll say, yes, but they are not really the abnormality. They are an indicator that something is going on in the breast. As you know, breast milk has a large amount of calcification. That's how babies get their calcium. They don't get it through calcium supplements or broccoli or other things. They get it through milk, just like we get it, cow's milk, goat's milk, whatever you happen to drink. So a lot of breast diseases are manifest as calcifications, the most common one being what people call fibrocystic disease. Fibrocystic disease commonly has calcifications associated with it and commonly are round, small, and all the same shape and size. If everything in the breast is the same shape and size, then that's a strong indicator that it's absolutely benign because it's really hard to have cancer throughout both breasts in the similar symmetric pattern. I mean, it's essentially unheard of. But if the calcifications, when you magnify them and you look at them in a, in a technique that magnifies them, if they're different shapes and sizes, you say, hmm, this is unusual. Most benign things are not different shapes and sizes because some forms of breast cancer, what the calcifications are are where the cells that we're reproducing, remember we talked about that, reproducing cells under the microscope? When cells are reproducing rapidly, some of them die because they're growing faster than the blood supply can supply them. When, the, when cells die, frequently calcifications are left behind. So if you have a tube full of cancer cells and several of those, several of those cells have died and they leave calcifications, they're irregular because there are cells all the way around them. And there are other cells in that duct that fill up the space that allow them not to be nice, smooth, round. Smooth and round indicates that they're sitting in the middle of something, like a, a stone in a puddle. But if the puddle is full of cells and the calcification is in the middle, it's not going to have a smooth, round shape because it's going to be distorted by all the other cells reproducing around it. And that's what we do with magnification views. All right, next. We're coming upon, and then again, using that same nomenclature, XCCL, exaggerated cranial caudal lateral view. As most women know, there's a little more tissue laterally than medially, right? You know, you're wearing a bra and a little more sticks out over here than in the center. That's the way the breast is designed. There's an axillary tail. The axilla is the armpit, and the breast has a tail of tissue that kind of goes toward the armpit. When abnormalities are in that area, sometimes it's really hard to see on standard views, and so we do this view where you go cranial caudal, but you're accentuating the lateral side of the breast. Usual cranial caudal is right in the center, the nipple is right at the midline, but laterally you compress the whole thing and you're looking at the lateral side, which is very helpful in identifying abnormalities that lie laterally. This is very important because uh, even though the breast has four quadrants, upper inner, upper outer, lower inner, lower outer, more breast cancers occur for some reason in the upper outer portion of the breast than anywhere else. And it's more than just based on the amount of breast tissue. Some people, and again, I'm not a breast cancer researcher, I'm a radiologist, some people theorize it has something to do with the axilla. The axilla has a, it's a higher temperature, so that area of the breast is exposed to a higher temperature at baseline. Some people think it has something to do with the lymphatic drainage. You know, we touch things with our hands and they, things get absorbed and then those drain lymphatically into the axilla and that that portion of the breast is exposed to more toxins than maybe elsewhere. So it's a known fact that that quadrant is affected more. So we have images that help us specifically evaluate that side when we think there's something there. Okay, next please. I think we have some images coming up. Oh no, after by rides. This section of slides is new from the last time because I got feedback that they wanted, the audience wanted to know more about BIRADS. So BIRADS, Breast Imaging Reporting and Data System. It's a standard nomenclature so that anyone reading a mammogram report should be able to get the same information on any patient. It tells us the density of the breast or the composition. It tells you the findings, anything that was seen on the mammogram, and the recommendations. One year follow-up, six month follow-up, additional views, 
mammogram views, ultrasound, etc. It applies to mammography, breast ultrasound, and breast MRI. Historically, it first just started to map with mammography because mammography was around longer than these other two modalities. Then breast ultrasound came on board because people wanted to know, hey, we're reading this ultrasound report and it's just kind of free form. Is there some way we can standardize it to make it sound like the mammography report so we can find out what we need to know? And it was standardized. And now breast MRI the same. We talk about the composition of the breast, the baseline enhancement, the distribution, et cetera. Next, please. So, BIRADS categories. This is really the bottom line. Oftentimes, doctors don't, or referring, referring clinicians, don't read the whole report, and they might not really need to. The BIRADS gives you the summary, the bottom line. Category zero, and as I did this before, I said zero, it's like a big hole. It's not filled in yet. We still need to find out more because we need more imaging. We need to know if what we're looking at is benign, potentially malignant, does it need follow-up, does it need a biopsy? So think of a zero as a big hole, still needs to be filled in. Category one, negative. You know, anytime the Philadelphia Eagles say, we're number one, we know it's true, and, number, and also that that's the best possible place to be. You know, one, you're, everything is negative, we'll see you in one year. So one is uniform. Yeah, I'm an Eagles fan, sorry, Washington. <laughs> Okay, number two, benign findings. So benign findings means it's the second best situation to be in. We see abnormalities in the breast, but we recognize them as characteristically benign. Either these nice, round, smooth calcifications, this nice, round uh, breast cyst, this abnormality that was previously biopsied that hasn't changed. We know it's benign because it had the pathologist told us it was benign. Benign, and then category three, probably benign. This one, a lot of people get really hamonkle on. And I'll say, ma'am, you have an abnormality. It's probably benign. We'll see you in six months. What do you mean probably? And I'll say, that's probably benign. <laughs> but what that really means, to the radiologist, that means that this abnormality should have imaging features that indicate less than a 2% chance that it's cancer. So if you're talking about a woman that's had a breast cancer in the past, they're already out of that category. Because if you've had breast cancer, you're no longer in the less than 2% chance club. If you had a first degree biological relative with breast cancer, you're no longer in the less than 2% chance of breast cancer if there's an abnormality on your mammogram. So these are abnormalities that are not absolutely certainly benign, but have all benign imaging features and all we really need to do is confirm that it's unchanged in six months, then you can go back to annual screening. Because if you have a mammogram on day one, and your six month follow up is day 365 divided by two, and we're recommending six month follow up, that takes you back to day one again. So you're only getting one extra imaging in the course of annual screening, and that's usually all it takes. Occasionally, and I do mean that, Occasionally, you'll see an abnormality six months later, and it's different, and you say, oh, absolutely, now goes to BIRADS category four. If something that's supposed to be unchanged changes, even if it turns out to be benign eventually, that's going to get a biopsy, because something that's changing over time makes us worried and is a higher than 2% chance of being, uh, of being cancer. So, it does happen occasionally. We'll see something and we'll say, oh, probably benign, we'll follow up. Plus, the other good thing is you're not waiting a year or two to see it. I hate, I hate, and I, I get sick to my stomach when I see a mammogram and it has a suspicious abnormality. And I say, well, what did this look like last year? And I go to the previous year and I either see it and it's smaller or they didn't have a mammogram that year. They had a mammogram two or three years before. And you say, oh, it's new. Then you're, then you're out of that BIRADS 3 category again. Something you can clearly tell is new becomes uh, suspicious. Now, women after menopause, when they have less estrogen and progesterone cycling around their bodies, their density of their breast tissue reduces. And it makes their mammograms nicer and easier to read. Not everyone, because I know some people, if they're a lot of uh, of, how do I say this, a lot of soy 
and soy products can have estrogenic, estrogenic effects. I'm not poo-pooing soy. I'm not telling you don't eat tofu and, and those beans that I like that you get in restaurants. You know what I'm talking about? Edamame. Yeah, I love edamame. I'm not saying don't eat that. I mean, but there are creams, there are lotions, there are things that people take that can make their breasts denser even after menopause. But usually menopause is a friend to the radiologist because things will get less dense. So if the breast gets less dense, but something that's been in there all along, then all of a sudden becomes a little more conspicuous. Those are often turns out to be BIRADS 3s because we look at it, it has all benign features, but we're not sure if it's really new or if it's just uh, unhidden, so to speak. So those things will often be 3s, and I've never had one of those 3s turn out to be something else because it's usually just the breast tissue is involuting and the abnormalities that were there before are still there. Category 5, highly suggestive of malignancy. That's when we look at it, we see it on the mammogram, we do the ultrasound, it's suspicious on mammogram. That used to be fat necrosis. Ten years ago, that was fat necrosis. <coughs> highly suggestive of malignancy until we got better at recognizing it. Uh, and then now, category 6, known malignancy. Oftentimes, women will have a mammogram, they'll have the callback mammogram, they'll have the ultrasound, they'll have the biopsy, they'll undergo treatment, uh, or depending on the size of the tumor, they'll have what's called neoadjuvant treatment. You know, before they have the definitive treatment, they'll have chemotherapy. And they do a mammogram to see, or a breast ultrasound, to see if the abnormality is getting smaller. And frequently, the, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy is fantastic at reducing the size of the tumor. So they'll get a mammogram six months down the line before they do the surgery, because they want the tumor to be a manageable size, and we'll see a cancer, we'll know it's a cancer and it's smaller, and then we'll say, oh, known, it's known malignancy. It doesn't mean they don't have cancer. Sometimes you can't see it anymore. That doesn't mean you don't have cancer. It just means the, uh, the treatment is working. And we'll still be, though, it'll still be known cancer because it's been there. So the report. Has, how many people have actually read mammography reports? Oh, very good. Hopefully it had all these categories because this is required by MQSA to be in every report. The density of the breast tissue. How many people are familiar with that phenomenon where you have to inform the lay, uh, the lay public of the density of their mammogram? I know it's required in California. It's becoming more and more common elsewhere. Uh, it's a standard part of every report and the only thing that's changed is you have to notify the patient of what their density is. Because a fatty breast, it's very easy to spot a cancer in a fatty breast. It's like, I mean, I used to play when, when I was a resident and my kids were in school, I played guess the abnormality with them. I'd bring home some films and I'd hold it up to light and I'll say, can you find what's abnormal? And they would point to the white thing in the black background. That was the breast cancer on a mammogram. Or that was the lung cancer in a lung where there's a lot of air, a lot of air in the chest, but there's nodule. So on a mammogram, a fatty breast is a delight. Scattered fibroglandular elements means that 25 to 50 percent of the breast has tissue in it. Fatty, by definition, means less than 25 percent of the breast has tissue elements. So it's real easy to tell sometimes when something is new in that fatty breast. Now, that's where the divider becomes between fatty and dense breasts. So when people say, I have a dense breast, it's not something they feel, it's a mammographic density. So heterogeneously dense means between 50 and 75 percent of the mammogram has tissue in it, which can obscure detection of a small new nodule. If the nodule is hidden behind uh, a lobule of breast tissue every year, you're not going to detect it until it gets big enough to not be obscured by the breast tissue that's already in there. Kind of like uh, on an eclipse. You know, you don't see it unless it's big enough to have a shadow cast by the, the earth or it's, it's separated enough to see an off lay. So if my hand is a lobule of breast tissue, you can't see the finger that's behind it right now. And sometimes on another view, there's another lobule of breast tissue hiding it from view. But as soon as this gets bigger than the lobule of breast tissue that's obscuring it, it changes, and then you can detect it. 
But the women with the heterogeneously dense and extremely dense breast tissue, we know it's harder to de detect cancers in those breasts because they're hidden by the breast tissue. That's why women need to know what kind of tissue they have. So hopefully, whoever's seeing them, whether it be uh, navigator, primary care, nurse practitioner, anybody can say to them, you know, the, re the report says your breast tissue is dense. You really should practice monthly self-breast exam. In the shower, same time of the month, every month. You know, we all know, does everybody know those, those things? The primary care docs know them very well. There was one in the back, right? Right? Do you know that about the reports? You emphasize that with your patients? You don't have to answer. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But it's very important because if the breast is fatty or scattered densities, uh, the mammogram is going to beat the palpable finding the cancer on palpation. But if the breast tissue is dense, palpation really should be emphasized. And if they're a high-risk patient with dense breast tissue, depending on how, how high-risk they are, they might, and I say might because I don't decide this, they might warrant ultrasound, they might warrant MRI screening, now that's a touchy issue because that's not uniformly covered by third-party payers. It's a, it's not, we're not there yet, but at a minimum, the dense line should absolutely have great emphasis on monthly self-breast exam and annual clinical breast exam. The next paragraph should be the findings. Oh, we see scattered characteristically benign calcifications. The distribution and pattern of the elements are unchanged from the previous mammograms. There's nothing new, et cetera, et cetera. A BIRADS category, whether it be zero, oh, we see an abnormality it needs further evaluation. One, negative, drive on, number one. Or two, benign findings. We see things and we know that they're benign, or we see things and they're completely unchanged from one year ago, two year ago, three year ago, et cetera. And then the bottom line, the recommendations. If it's a zero, the recommendations are going to be something like additional views, spot compression, rolled view, ultrasound. If it's a BIRADS 2, the recommendation is going to be C in a year. If it's BIRADS 1, C in a year. Next, please. So that's the report. So this is just to give you an example of what a mammogram looks like. MLO views, we're looking at the breast from an angle. There's the pectoralis muscle, and then CC views. This would be eh, between a fatty and a scattered fibroglandular elements. Because you can see the breast elements. The lines are those ligaments that we talked about. The lines are little ligaments, but the little nodular areas are just the, uh, the glandular elements. And there's a nice round calcification. See right there? Calcification. Next. This would give you a difference. This is a one patient, this is a different patient. This is a fatty breast, this is a heterogeneously dense breast. If there was a five millimeter nodule right here, we would see it. It's on a C, it's in a background of a sea of fat. Here, if you put a five millimeter nodule, snowball's chance in hell of seeing that on this view. You might see it on the CC view. You might not, because the same amount of breast tissue is going to be seen from the other direction but you're hoping that by using two different views, you have your best chance of finding something in the breast. But this is giving an example how much more difficult it is to find something new in this breast, the dense breast, compared to the fatty breast. Again, the emphasis on physical exam in this patient. Scattered fibroglandular elements, we see breast tissue. See these little reverse curves? We were talking about those earlier. Little curve here, little curve here. Little curve here, little curve here. Those are just the ligaments. And this is normal. This is a fatty breast that probably didn't have a mammogram in a couple of years because this is big. And if it was brand new, we'd expect it in this fatty breast to really be conspicuous when small. So this has either been there a while or it's been growing very rapidly since the last mammogram. I can't tell. Like I said, if there was a mammogram the previous year and it wasn't there, that's growing really fast and that's really concerning. If the last mammogram was five years ago, I'd be like, well, it's new, but I don't know if it's new in the last year or if it's been gradually growing for five years. If it's been slowly growing for five years, it's probably not as aggressive a cancer 
as something that just popped up in the last year. But that's pretty conspicuous. Next, please. This is calcific. Oh, this shows up better than I expected. These calcifications, OK, so that's kind of a dot. This is kind of a rectangle. That one's a little bit of a curve. These are suspicious calcifications because they're not, right? Everyone would agree, these are not round, smooth calcifications. Correct, thank you for playing along. This is a suspicious cluster of calcifications, and the abnormality, the abnormal tissue, is in between the calcifications. If I could ask you to hallucinate for a second, you notice the fat, and you notice a little bit of increased density amongst the calcifications relative to the fat around it? That's a big tip off that these calcifications are associated with a cancer that's about this size. Because where the fat is, you don't see any density. And then I go this way, and I start to see increased density. From the top, I come down, oop, increased density. From the side, oop, increased density associated with the calcifications. This is a suspicious abnormality. This is either a ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, the cancer is still only in the ducts, or DCIS and an invasive carcinoma that has made its way out of the duct and is now infiltrating in the breast. Next, please. So we talked about tomosynthesis earlier. I mentioned it. Now, do you remember that fatty breast? How I said, boy, you could put something five millimeters or centimeters behind one of those big, dense lobules, and I really would have a very slim chance of seeing it? Tomosynthesis gets us around that a little bit. Tomosynthesis is to mammography what CT is to x-rays. So on a chest x-ray, you're taking a shadow, you're taking an image of the entire thickness of the chest, breast, ribs, sternum, lungs, blood vessels, interstitium, back muscles, ribs on the backside, skin, and taking all that density and making a picture that's just a picture. CT, you're taking that same body and you're cutting it in slices and you're looking at each slice and you can see the breasts in the front, the, the pectoralis muscle, the intercostal muscles, the ribs, the pleura, the lung tissue, the blood vessels. Then you're looking at the, the back of the chest wall pleura, then the ribs, then the intercostal muscles, then the latissimus dorsi, and the other ones that you people that work out all the time get those nice strong shoulders, and the skin on the back. And you can see all those layers because you're taking x-rays from different angles and, different, and detecting them, and then a computer is saying where that is. Is it in the front? Is it in the back? Is it in the middle? Is it medial? Is it lateral? Is it cranial? Is it caudal? And we're looking at the breast in little slices all the way through. So if something is directly behind something, you're going to see the tissue. And then all of a sudden, when you get to the slice that's behind that tissue, you're going to see something. You're going to say, ooh, that's denser. And it's not smooth and has those nice little reverse curves that we saw elsewhere. So that's the beauty of digital breast tomosynthesis. I have to say, I, uh, when asked about it, if I look at the mammogram and it's a fatty breast, I say, you really, I, I really don't recommend tomosynthesis. You're really not adding any benefit to it because you have, there's a fatty breast. And something new and suspicious should really be easy to detect. So my experience is that the denser the breast tissue, the more beneficial the tomosynthesis. But I, I don't yet say, absolutely, you should have it. I let that decision be between uh, the patient and their doctor. But that's where the benefit is the greatest. Just like when we went from screening mammogram on film to screening mammogram on digital. It's an improvement. And I have to say, the tomosynthesis to digital improvement is greater than the digital to film screen, and of a similar order of magnitude as CT compared to X-ray. Next, please. So here's an example. Here's an abnormality on just a regular overlapping, all the images are there, mammogram. And that looks suspicious. It's irregular, and it's denser than all the other breast tissue. But if you look at all the slices, these are not the same picture. These are just different slices through the same breast. There's really tissue and fat, tissue and fat, tissue and fat, tissue and fat, tissue and fat. So this is just all that tissue lined up to make it look like there's something there. And it's really not an abnormality. So the tomosynthesis 
improves our ability to say yes, something suspicious, as well as no, something is not suspicious. It's not foolproof. It's not 100% one way or the other. There's still a learning curve, like any new technology is, is introduced. Initially, you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh, is that real? Is that not real? But as, as radiologists and, and others get experience with them, you get better and better at uh, identifying what is really an abnormality that needs further evaluation and what is just something benign that we're seeing. Next set, please. Similar. So you see on this image, there's a little something there. And on this one, it's pointing to an area. But here's the tomosynthesis image. Whoa! It's way more. So it's nothing, 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 something, then nothing, 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 nothing. So when you get to the slice that has the something, you see something there that's way more conspicuous than the regular mammogram. So you say, oh, there's something. It has angles, it has shape, it has thickness. And then here, you really don't see anything at all there. And you do the tomosynthesis, and you think, I think there's a little something there. And here it is magnified. This is this one magnified, and this is this one magnified. There's something kind of bulging uh, from the back side. See the bulge from the back that you really don't appreciate here. You get a sense of it. But that's the, uh, that's the advantage. So here's the regular mammogram. Here's the tomosynthesis image. I mean, to me, I look at that and I say, yeah, I see something there. But here I say, whoa, let's stop right there and let's take a look at that. Let's get an ultrasound. And uh, if we can't find an ultrasound, I'll still recommend some fine of kind of biopsy because this has all suspicious features. Again, this is just to show you what we go through when we're doing this, not that you should ever be expected to look at these and say, oh, there's the abnormality. <laughs> if you come visit me somewhere, I'll show you. <laughs> just another example without tomosynthesis <laughs> and with tomosynthesis. You can see these little spicules. This is, this is the cancer going into the breast tissue. When people call infiltrating or invasive, again, the pathologist calls it because they see the cancer cells going into the tissue. But on mammography, this is what it looks like. It's going into the adjacent tissue. It's not pushing the tissue ahead of it. You know, if I'm getting bigger and bigger and I'm benign, I'm just gradually going to push. Whereas if I'm cancer and I'm getting bigger and bigger, I'm going to kind of just grow into him. But that's the difference, pushing versus infiltrating or invading. OK, so breast ultrasound, we'll go through quickly. It's an adjunct to mammography. I don't have an opinion one way or the other. If that's what the woman is comfortable having and that's what their doctor wants her to have, that's what we do. I'm not an advocate for it because you don't see calcifications and there are some things that we might be hard to find because we're just kind of looking throughout the whole breast and we're not exactly sure if there's an area we should be more attentive to. On ultrasound, it's hard to tell where the breast tissue is dense and you're going to obscure something on mammo. Or if it's a fatty breast, mammography is way better than ultrasound. But nonetheless, it's excellent for evaluating palpable abnormalities. A woman comes in and says, I feel something here that I didn't feel last month. Ultrasound is an excellent way to evaluate that. Typically, it's going to be a cyst, but I can't say that with certainty. Evaluation of pain, nipple discharge, evaluation of mammographic abnormalities or abnormalities seen on MRI. Ultrasound-guided breast biopsy is one of the best methods for characterizing abnormalities because you can see the needle actually going into the abnormality under ultrasound. When you're doing a biopsy by MAMO or stereo, what we call stereotactic biopsy, you're seeing the abnormality, you're seeing the needle, then you're firing the needle and you're taking samples. MRI as well. You see the abnormality, you see the needle, but then you're putting, you're trying to get the needle into it, and then you're taking samples. But ultrasound, you can see the abnormality, you can see the needle, and you can see it going into or next to, and you can actually see the little pieces taken. So a lot of times if we see abnormalities on mammo or breast MRI, we do an ultrasound after the fact and say, look, in the upper outer quadrant, about six centimeters to the nipple, and if you can see something by ultrasound, that's your, that's your monster, biopsy that. Next, please. So this is a cyst. I know this is a cyst because there's nothing on the inside. And the sound that entered on this edge came out going faster. Because what happens to sound in water? It speeds up. So the sound goes in here, speeds up. And then the power, it just echoes. It rebounds off this side way more, more uh, intensely than on the front side. That's a cyst. We see that on, on ultrasound all the time. We say, buy RADS 2, see in a year. Don't have to do anything. Next. That's a solid mass. But you see the margins are round. 
they're pushing the tissue, that's a fibroadenoma. I've seen so many of these over the years that a lot of, a lot of people still biopsy fibroadenomas because they're solid masses. Uh, the really, the, the breast ultrasound gurus say, if you see something, it looks like a fibroadenoma, just do a follow-up because you really don't want to be biopsying all these benign abnormalities, especially in younger women. Uh, that's what I've been taught, but I'm, again, it's up to the, some patients are nervous, and they say, I have a tumor, and we say, yeah, it's a tumor, but it looks very benign, I'd recommend a follow-up. They cannot sleep at night knowing they have a tumor, even if it's benign, then get the biopsy, prove it, and let them get some sleep. If the if that's what they choose. Next. Not a benign. See the margins? You can't see that. Remember that nice push we saw in the last one? These are irregular margins. It's kind of growing into the tissue next to it. And it's shadowing. It's eating the sound beam because what's going on in there is a lot of active cell growth and, and irregular growth. It's not growing in a nice, smooth, circumferential manner. It's going into the tissue and causing shadowing. That's a small breast cancer. Next, I think I have a couple more cancers. That's another breast cancer. See the irregular margins? Remember the, the tomosynthesis image and I said, oh, there's that little spicule growing. This is a spicule right here. There it is, growing in. These little ones here, but this is the most conspicuous one. That's why I put that image. Next, another little bitty one. But nonetheless, not abnorm it's abnormal, I'd biopsy that because it's irregular. That still might turn out to be something benign but I'm not going to let that grow because it does not have all those nice features of the other one. Rounded, smooth, pushing, homogeneous internally. Next, we're getting close to the end. Another big kind of benign looking, but does have some angles to it. It has some growing margins, so I'd probably biopsy that. And breast MRI, we talked about, I'm not going to show you just a couple images real quick. You know, breast MRI is often used as a problem solver. Oftentimes, breast surgeons will get a breast MRI before they do a lumpectomy or mastectomy to make sure there's not something else in the breast because the patient has high risk factors for having something else at the same time. And so they'll get a breast MRI. Uh, sometimes uh, doctors that run high risk clinics will get them periodically in patients with the BRCA mutations. Am I speaking Greek or have people heard of the BRCA mutations? Okay, I just don't want to, yes. So th that's a big cancer with extension and probably other smaller foci, and that's the normal negative breast. Next, same thing, cancer, little satellite lesion involving another quadrant to the breast, normal breast. Next, cancer, satellite lesion, maybe some lymph nodes, normal breast. And summary, here we go. Screening mammography we talked about applies to essentially all women that have breasts, 40 and over. Callback and diagnostic mammography, callback if you have abnormal screening, diagnostic if there's a reason to look at the breast more intently. Family history, pain, palpable abnormality, nipple discharge, something wrong with that breast. Breast density and birads, remember the scattered, the, the, the fatty breasts, mammography is wonderful. The denser breasts, you really got to emphasize uh, monthly self-breast exam and consider other things, uh, especially in a higher risk woman, maybe tomosynthesis, maybe ultrasound, maybe breast MRI. Again, you have to look at the patient overall, not just uh, the mammogram. You know, if it's a 95-year-old woman, some doctors will say, you know, some, uh, this because I spoke to a women's group and there were a lot of elderly women, they said, when should I stop having a mammogram? And I say, when you and your doctor decide that you're not going to do anything about it if something's there, by absolutely you should stop. A lot of times we see elderly women that are having trouble walking in to get their mammogram, and then we find an abnormality and we have to call it. We can't say it's negative because it's not our decision, but we have to call and we say it's a suspicious abnormality, and by lingo, we have to say, suspicious abnormality, biopsy should be considered. Even though we, we know that that probably won't happen, we, have to, we as the radiologists have to go by the standard BIRADS categories because if someone reviews that mammogram and says, oh my God, there's this big cancer, and they said, probably benign, they're going to what the hell is that person doing? So it's a, it, the answer is between the patient and the doctor. If you have congestive heart failure, with an expected life expectancy of one to two years, 
screening mammography might not be the thing for you or your patient or who you're, who you're referring to. But again, it's not the radiologist's call, so don't ask the radiologist, should I get a mammogram? Discuss it with the patient or have the doctor look at the patient and, and then use uh, common sense. Next. Okay, questions? Yes, ma'am. So my question is about um, sonography. Is the, the requirements for reporting for mammography going to change so that they match for breast sonography? So having a BIRAD, a finding, a recommendation? Yes, they should. They should okay. already. Okay. All right. They're not going to be question. density mm -hmm. because you don't get density with ultrasound. with ultrasound. There'll be some comment about the findings. Mm -hmm. There should absolutely be a BIRADS and a recommendation. Because okay. sometimes the recommendation is six-month follow-up ultrasound. Sometimes the recommendation is return to annual screening mammography. So if they only do a, a sonogram, will they have those requirements? They yes. have to report those? Absolutely. Okay. Except for density. Okay. You're welcome. So many questions, but I'll be brief. Um, I'm a nurse, and I feel like the physicians are not doing their part in terms of educating women about density. And this part two of that is tomosynthesis. In any mammography place you go, myself or our patients or whoever, they go up to the desk, and there's a clerk that says, would you like to have tomosynthesis? Mm -hmm. Make your credit card, please. My patients mostly don't speak English. They're given a sheet densely written in English. Here's what this is about, $50. Sometimes they just give the $50 because they don't understand. I cannot get my doctors to counsel people on it. And so asking people who are low income, uninsured, $50, some of them will not have it. Some of them have it, but mm -hmm. it's a bigger deal than somebody, oh, $50 is nothing. Counsel me, what shall I say to them? That's why people? I'm speaking here today. So you know, if you look at their last year's mammogram report, if it says fatty or scattered fibroglandular elements, I really can't recommend tomosynthesis. Right. But most people don't have that. And my, I've got more than half. In their I'm report? Sure, or de I mean, they're more dense and heterogeneously dense. Yeah. Majority, so. So th those, those are the ones that I can, again, you're talking to an imager. I don't see the patients and talk to the patients unless there's an abnormality. Yeah. But if the mammogram report says heterogeneously dense can reduce the can obscure a small detection of a small mass of mammography, that's the lingo, or extremely dense can lower the sensitivity of mammography, and they and they're on the on the fence, I would say that would be the one that I would say, if they offer you tomosynthesis, based on what I'm seeing in your report last year, I, I suggest you consider it. Or if they offer you tomosynthesis, from what I'm reading about your mammogram last year, say no thank you. Just like mm -hmm. uh, Consumer Reports people say, if they offer you extended warranty, say no. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that would, yeah. be, that would be, that's why I wanted to emphasize that in the report. That's what I tell people when I'm on a bus or I'm walking around. They say, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a happy radiologist. And they say, really? And I say, yeah, I've been happy my whole life. I've just been a radiologist for the last 15 years. <laughs> And they say, oh, I was reading this article in the New York Times about density and this and that. And I say, if your report says dense, Find I would suggest the tomosynthesis is reasonable. My wife asked me. She said, do I need to have a tomosynthesis? I said, no. It's a regular mammogram. Digital mammogram is fine for you. I know what your mammogram looks like. She chose not to. Mm -hmm. She didn't even have to have the additional pay. There was not a reason for her to have it. There's a little more radiation. Mm -hmm. And so I don't recommend it uniformly. I'm sorry, Kingston. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what I use as my rationale. Okay. The dense, fatty right. dichotomy. Thank you. Hi, well, thank you very much, Dr. Oh, Brando. you're very welcome. We recommend the mammogram at age 40, but right now that the woman get cancer more, mm -hmm. you know, younger. So you already talked uh, and said um, the woman who has a first relative uh, suggests 10 years at the age the first relative got right. the cancer. In conjunction with their doctor deciding. Oh, okay. Yeah. How is the risk 
for the body to get the mammogram. You know, I started, let's oh. say, it, at age 30. How you can, because it's very common, the, uh, the woman asks, oh, well, I'm going to expose to the radiation. So how can I answer this question? Uh, I would say uh, in a high-risk population, mm -hmm. I, th I think, and the literature supports, that the benefits outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. In a average risk population, mm -hmm. I do not recommend starting any earlier than 40. Okay. okay. But again, it's still, you have to do it in conjunction because the thing is, sometimes women aren't sure if the diagnosis was premenopausal, was it really breast cancer, mm -hmm. was it something else? And uh, it can be challenging to kind of dig down and find out what someone actually had. Uh, so, uh, and that's what I, that's what I tell clinicians. Uh, no earlier than mm -hmm. 10 years prior to the onset mm -hmm. of the diagnosis of the first degree biological relative. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious what, what, uh, I thought I saw her walk in. I'd be curious what she tells patients. Oh, well, I said, uh, um. No, I'm going to see, I what, mean, what, uh, what does she tell patients? What she said is it's extremely unlikely that she'll recommend beginning before 40 unless there's a really strong clinical indication like the BRCA positive mm -hmm. or other things. So, and that's why I, I, I said that, not so much because I want everybody to start really early because I, I get sometimes referrals for mammograms and someone's 25 and I say, no, no, don't do that. More so than the other way. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thanks again, Dr. Perry.